view of what the plans are for, for this morning. Um, we have our guest speaker, whom I'm going to be introducing more formally in, in just a minute. Uh, and uh, he will speak for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have questions. Um, we'll uh, break sometime after about 9 o'clock uh, for a break and uh, uh, for a book signing as well, if people are interested in that. Um, we'll come back here at 10 o'clock, and we'll have a uh, roundtable session discussing uh, the morning, uh, the earlier session, and we'll be out of here by about uh, 11.45 or so. So it's a really uh, uh, great, interesting morning uh, on a very interesting topic. So I, I hope uh, everybody will be around for uh, uh, the entire morning. Um, I have the honor uh, this morning of introducing our, our guest speaker, um, Professor Benjamin Barber. This is called the Big Thinkers series, and certainly Dr. Professor Barber is a big thinker, but he's also a big doer. He's uh, very active. Uh, in addition to being uh, uh, a superb uh, academic, he's also very active in, in the community in a, in a variety of ways. It's uh, uh, really not an overstatement to suggest that he has really had an impact on shaping the discipline of political science, but it goes beyond that. His involvement in the community and uh, the various things that he's done has really had an impact in shaping society and shaping the way uh, people in uh, people think about democracy and think about uh, governing. Um, Professor Barber is currently uh, a senior research scholar with the uh, Center on Philanthropy and uh, Civil Society at the uh, City University of New York. He's also the founder and president of Civ World, and he is the Walt Whitman Professor Emeritus at uh, Rutgers University. Um, he has combined uh, his background as a distinguished scholar and political theorist um, with a practical commitment to uh, democratic uh, civic practice. He's in addition to being an academic, he's a fundraiser, he's an administrator, a public speaker, um, and an educational and political uh, consultant. Uh, he's worked for uh, President Bill Clinton. He's worked in various places uh, in Europe. He's on uh, a number of editorial boards. But what's very interesting is the way he's used his position as a public intellectual to speak to the broader community. Probably a number of us have seen him on Tavis with speaking with uh, people like, like Tavis Smiley and uh, Charlie Rose. Um, he worked with Patrick Watson uh, to uh, produce the uh, uh, TV, a, a TV series uh, for, uh, called The Struggle for Democracy with, uh, that was PBS, combined PBS, BBC uh, series. He's written 17 books, and these books have had a significant role in shaping society. Things like the book that he's going to be talking today, uh, talking about today, If Mares Ruled the World, has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, his books like Strong Democracy and Jihad versus uh, um, uh, McWorld have all gotten a great deal of uh, attention. He has a PhD and an MA from uh, Harvard and a BA from Grinnell College. Um, and uh, with that uh, introduction, I'd like uh, Professor Barber to uh, come and uh, talk to us uh, today about uh, uh, if mayors ruled the world. And then uh, after he speaks, he's agreed to uh, respond to some questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David, and thank you to the Federation of Humanities and Social Sciences. I wish we had that kind of an organization in the United States. As you know, we're much more siloed in our approach to these uh, issues. Thank you all for being up. I was horrified when I realized we were <laughs> going to be gathering here at, in the pre small pre-dawn hours when intelligent people like me are in bed usually, and like you too. So thank you so much for getting up so early 
uh, to, to be here, but I hope uh, I will minimally not interfere with your napping and possibly even keep you, keep you awake uh, for the next uh, period of time. And we should have a very interesting morning because I will introduce some themes here. Uh, and after uh, the book signing, we will have an opportunity to meet with a number of uh, mayors, including, I know, a very popular mayor here, Rob, uh, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know who I mean, uh, Mr. Nenshi from Calgary, uh, and others. So that should be uh, extremely interesting as well. Uh, it's, I, I spent a lot of time in, in Canada uh, in the old days. I spent time here, can you all hear, I'm gonna, I have a mic here, is this one working? You all hear me okay? It's still, still working well? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I've come a lot, and like so many uh, Yankees, like so many uh, U.S. citizens, uh, for a long time I came here because this was really a place uh, where there was a reasonableness in uh, the citizenry, where there was an engagement in politics, where there was a deep concern with climate, and uh, where we had a kind of model of what were we not so greedy and absorbed uh, in our own narcissism in the United States, what we could look like. I can't say that's true anymore, I'm sorry to say. Uh, and one of the things I want to talk about a little later when we talk about climate and cities is, is what's happened uh, here in uh, kind of lo Canada losing its way, uh, from my point of view, as a model for so many people uh, in so many different places. But I want to talk today about cities and what cities can do because, as you will see, my argument is going to be that we need to focus far more today on cities metro regions, uh, the urban parts of the world, if we are to continue to make progress towards civilization, sustainability, social justice, and a an answer to global problems. And in case it wasn't evident, and I think it is to this audience, uh, we start with the reality of a global crisis today in democracy. And uh, David said some nice things about, about me and about democracy, but if I have some responsibility for democracy, then I guess I have some responsibility for its pallid state in the world today because democracy, in my mind, is in trouble, principally and above all in the old democracies, where it was born, where it flourished, uh, where it was cultivated, and where uh, today we see the most alarming kinds of developments uh, just start with the European elections, uh, over last weekend, you know uh, that in Europe, after 60 or 70 years of this noble experiment in pooled sovereignty, in overcoming the nationalisms that led to one war after the other uh, throughout the 20th century, uh, Europe is now in full flight from Brussels, in full rebellion against what is seen there as a bureaucratic, top-down, arrogant, Brussels-centered approach to Europe that is being repelled by the very people it was meant to serve, working people, farmers, workers, and even immigrants as well. What we are seeing, in other words, in Europe is a breakdown of the European experiment, a reactionary nationalism going back to the very forms of isolation, separation, anti-foreign feeling, anti-Muslim feeling uh, that represent the worst of Europe and a move against the attempt to create a trans-border, transnational Europe that represents new forms of citizenship, new forms of identity, new forms of community. So that development in Europe the place where I think most of us looked for hope to overcoming and transcending nationalism suggests that in the noblest experiment, democracy is in trouble. I hardly need tell you about democracy south of your border in the United States where political paralysis, polarization, anti-government feeling, and an unwillingness to see government do almost any of the things that it's supposed to do has become not just a distrust of government, but a deep denial of the power of democracy itself. Because at some point, the attack on government becomes an attack on democracy. The attack on them, whether in Ottawa or Washington or Paris or London, becomes an attack on us. 
our community, our democratic institutions, our capacity to exercise a common will to make common decisions in the public interest. So the crisis in democracy which we see, even in the oldest democracies, is alarming enough. And then you go to areas like the Middle East, where we're coming off of, this is about three years now, into an Arab Spring that has gone to winter with no apparent summer, where almost all of the nations deeply engaged at one point in a rebellion against traditional hegemony and authority now find themselves locked more into new forms of hegemony and authority than ever before with the complicity of the very people who were engaged in the democratic revolution. So that we see the sad story of an Egyptian new class trained as young lawyers and techies and people who believed in a secular democratic Europe reacting to the first popular elections in Egypt, the election of Mr. Morsi and the Brotherhood, by calling back in the army to oust the democratically elected government because they didn't like the outcome. Same thing in Ukraine. We don't want to forget that the president who was chased out uh, and led to the downfall of the regime that led in turn to the chaos we see there now was democratically elected. When people think the way to remove a president you don't like is armed rebellion or the intervention of the army, you know they don't understand democracy. But that is democracy without citizens. And in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in so many other parts of the world, we have a kind of top-down democracy without citizens in which we, and we have a lot of complicity in this, we have insisted if you have an election, you have democracy not understanding our own history in which elections are the final stage of building a democracy, not the first stage. First, you develop civic institutions. First, you develop citizenship. First, you develop education, educational institutions. First, you develop a strong civil society. Then you begin to create political institutions that bottom up create the basis for democracy. That's a lesson the West has totally forgotten with the experience in Libya and elsewhere, our view is if you decapitate a tyranny, you get a democracy. And of course, that's nonsense. When you decapitate a tyranny, Aristotle told us a long time ago, what you get is anarchy, chaos, warfare, civil war, and generally, as the Greeks knew, renewed tyranny overthrowing tyranny and creating democracy are two totally distinct processes. And we should know in the West where we took anywhere from a couple of hundred to six or seven hundred years to even develop the not so strong democratic institutions today that we have, that you can't do it overnight. And that you can't do it with B-1 bombers and tanks and boots on the ground. That's not how democracy is created. So, simple fact, democracy is in trouble in the old democracies, and it's in even deeper trouble in the new democracies. And in a way, the consequences are even worse in the new democracies because you now have a lot of people around the world, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, and Iraq, who, not having experienced democracy, are convinced it doesn't work and who are now, in effect, looking for alternatives to democracy. And in that world, we need to look very carefully at the nature of our political institutions and see whether there are not alternative ways to govern. And it is in that context that I suggest in my book that we change the subject. As political scientists, as social scientists, as citizens, as politicians, we stop thinking about nation states and start thinking about cities again. Stop thinking about prime ministers and presidents and provincial governors and start thinking about mayors and city councilors and city managers. Stop thinking about citizens as those passive, complacent television watchers who see citizenship as the culture of complaint, something to watch and complain about, but not participate in, and go back to the earlier notion of citizenship 
from which the etymology of citizen comes, cité and citoyen, citizen and city, and begin to think about the more active, engaged, responsible citizens of the neighborhood, of the urban district, of the town, and of the city. And when we do that, when we change the subject, all sorts of new opportunities open up for solving our problems, not just within our cities, but globally. Because here's the other part of the conversation about democracy. It's not just that democracy is not working, cannot work effectively within nation states. It is also that nation states have proved, quite aside from whatever deficiencies they have internally, they have proved incapable of dealing with the new interdependent global problems that define the 21st century, that define our new millennium. We live with a disturbing dilemma. All of our political, social, economic, and cultural challenges are fundamentally global in character. And all of the political institutions that respond to them are independent, local, sovereign, and separate. So we respond to 21st century problems of interdependence with 17th century nation states that frankly were never designed to work together. They were designed for independent jurisdiction and authority. I mean, think of the problems we face. There's no problem of Toronto warming, Niagara warming, Buffalo warming, Vancouver warming, North American warming. It's global warming. That's the climate problem. I tried to get on the web last night, but I couldn't find the Niagara web when I was here, or the Brock web. There's a world wide web. Technology today crosses borders. When I was growing up in Manhattan, a long time ago, my mother used to say, don't go to New Jersey this morning, dear. There's a virus in New Jersey. I don't want you to get sick. <laughs> I don't worry about the New Jersey virus. I still live in New York. I worry about the West Nile virus, Mexican pig virus, Hong Kong flu, the new diseases coming out of the hot zones of Africa that spread around the world in weeks, literally, because of the nature of modern communications and modern immigration patterns. Disease takes the form of global pandemics, and no one nation can any longer think, even with a good health system like yours, let alone with a terrible health system like ours, that they can begin to deal with such issues. Crime, drugs, all global in character. Narco states like Colombia and Mexico and others are just part of now a global criminal syndicate that works again across boundaries. Even the new terrorist organizations understand interdependence. What is Al Qaeda but a malevolent non-governmental organization? with no attachments to any particular national capital. One of the reasons after 9-11 we had such a problem dealing with terrorism and still do is that President Bush assumed, along with a lot of other people, that we've been attacked. And when you're attacked, you look for the address from which the attack comes, a national capital. You assume another country in the old nationalist model has attacked you. So we looked first to Iraq, and then Afghanistan. We're withdrawing now from both those countries without having defeated Al-Qaeda. But of course, Al-Qaeda is not a typical, traditional, nation-based organization. It is an organization without boundaries. And it was never in Iraq. It was in Afghanistan. But it left there to Indonesia and Sudan and Somalia. Now America's, even as we withdraw from Afghanistan, you may have noticed that we're putting black ops and special troops into Africa. And I guarantee you two or three years from now, they're going to say, that's not enough. We need some boots on the ground to go after Al-Qaeda there. But by then, Al-Qaeda will be somewhere else. And of course, we never learned the lesson of 9-11, which is that the 19 terrorists who committed those acts didn't come from abroad. They came from New Jersey and Texas and Florida, where they've been living for years. And they used American airliners as their weapons. 
Remember back a while ago, President Reagan had the notion of putting a kind of sealed hermetic globe around America, a sort of Star Wars defense, so nobody, no bombers, nobody could get into the United States. Imagine he had somehow done that. It would have made no difference on 9-11, because the terrorists came from inside, not outside. I was living then, I was at Rutgers, and I was living for a while in New Jersey, and when Bush said after 9-11, any state that harbors, even unknowingly, terrorists is the enemy of the United States and will get our wrath, I thought, is New Jersey in trouble? Because two or three of the terrorists had lived in New Jersey for a couple of years. That is the new world. An interdependent global climate, an interdependent global technology, global transportation, global immigration patterns of labor, global capital, what started as a fiscal crisis in London and Frankfurt and New York quickly became a global crisis in 2007, 2008 because finance capital is global in character. So every single problem we face today globally around the world is an interdependent cross-border challenge and we are without the wherewithal to deal with it because we still try to respond with nation states and with nation state based international institutions like the United Nations the Bretton Woods institutions, which themselves represent the same sovereign states that can't work together and were never designed to work together. The political theorists here will know that Hobbes and Bodin and others had one big problem. They had this beautiful idea of a social contract that allowed citizens to come together to support peace and comity among one another, but they could never figure out how to get the states that those social contracts created to do the same with one another. So in effect, states remained in a condition of the war of all against all, and still do today. And we see how quickly things can revert back to that. What's happening in Ukraine today is not the reappearance of the Soviet Union, it's the reappearance of 18th and 19th century nationalisms. Ukrainian, East Ukrainian, Russian, Crimean, people identifying with the old ethnicities, the old nationalisms, and killing each other around those nationalisms. So not only do we live in a world where jurisdictionally nations are not doing very well, but we live in a world whose problems and challenges cross borders in ways that make nation states sovereign and independent, unlikely, improbable, poor candidates for problem solving globally. So now we join that to the problem, not just the internal paralysis and difficulty and bureaucratization of nation states, but also their inability to cooperate across borders to deal with cross-border problems. And that's again where I say, then change the subject, turn back to cities. Let's look at mayors, and let's look at how they operate and whether there aren't clues to problem solving, both internally but also globally, in that secret. And the argument I want to make is that there are powerful reasons why cities are doing particularly well today. It has to do with what they were and what they are. What they were, of course, was the cradle of civilization, the cradle of democracy. We are, as a Glazer says, a, an urban species. When Aristotle said man is a political animal, he might have said man is an urban animal, a polis animal. We are drawn to cities. Urbanization has been a trend everywhere from the beginning of time. And today, you know, just a couple of years ago, urbanization meant that for the first time in human history, more than half of the world's population was living in cities. And every year, the percentage goes up. And in the developed part of the world, in Canada, the United States, Japan, Europe, that figure is closer to 80%. Four out of five people live in cities or metro regions grows. Just a few decades ago, China had about a billion people in villages and about 300,000, 300 million people in the cities within 300 kilometers of the coast. Today, there's six or 700 million there, and people are leaving the villages in droves to come to those new cities. In the last 10 years, there have been 100 new cities with a million people in China, 100 new cities with over a million people. And that trend continues. Chongqing, which was the wartime capital for the Kuomintang during World War II, today has 35 million people in its metro.
metro region, more than the population of a majority of the world's states. One city. So urbanization is a reality. And the movement of people to cities is crucial. Because cities are not just another level of governance. Cities are also the fundamental, the essential, the defining human community. Cities are where we're born, grow up, where we're educated, we get married, we have children, we work, we play, we pray, we create, we get old and we die. Most people, first of all, associate with the cities they come from. You ask somebody where they're from, they may say Canada if they're in Japan, or they may say the US if they're in Canada, but even then they're much more likely to say, oh, I'm from Louisville, I'm from Medellin, I'm from Nancy, I'm from Brussels, I'm from Amsterdam. Because those are the defining communities. So cities aren't just a level of government. We political scientists think of everything as levels of administration. There's the super region, there's the state, there's the province, there's the larger city, there's the neighborhood. But the city is something different. The polis is something different. It defines our human community, so it's vital to us. And it means that we have an association and an engagement with and in the city that's very different from our national citizenship. And it means, and it's a fact, that people continue today, even in this era of deep distrust of government, to trust their mayors, to trust government in the cities. Almost everywhere in the world, if you do trust polls, you'll find that national governments are not trusted, city governments still are. In the United States, you know Obama's, the presidency's rating is around 40%. The Supreme Court, that used to do very well, seen as independent, is under 50%. The Congress of the United States, the most directly elected body, one in 10 of the people who vote for it trust it. One in 10. But you ask the same question about mayors, city councilors, the numbers shoot up. 70, 75, even 80% of people say, well, yeah, I kind of trusted. The, the, I mean, look at even Rob Ford. You know his ratings when he went into rehab were higher than Obama's? Some would say, well, that's Obama's problem, isn't it? Or Toronto's problem. But on the other hand, what it meant, what, that was a little bit of a testimony. Yeah, but he's our guy. He may be a crazy man, he may be a drug addict, but he's our guy, and he's from the community, he's kind of doing his best, which isn't very good, but still. And that's the way, you know, it's a different mindset. It's a different mindset when we come to mayors. And I know Mayor Nenji, who's going to be here later uh, this morning, you know, is extremely popular, in part because he's a mayor. In Holland, which is really a country of cities more than anything else, they've been through a lot of difficulties. But if you look at the recent parliamentary elections for Europe, Holland's one of the few states that did not see a big growth of the right-wing parties that Garrett Builders and others do. That's partly because of the robustness of cities. Ali Hirsi left there. There are a lot of people who think, well, the Dutch, they really can't deal with Muslims, except for the fact that Rotterdam has a Muslim-born, Moroccan-born mayor who's the most popular mayor in Holland today. Like Nenshi, not because he's Muslim, not because he was born in Morocco, but because he's a hell of a good mayor. And people think he really embodies and represents the city and the needs of the city. And I would argue that it is in part because of the influence of cities and mayors in Holland that they withstood more than a lot of other parts of Europe. They withstood the tendency to vote a reactionary, nationalist, anti-Brussels mandate in these elections. I mean, United Kingdom's independence party and the Front National in France had extraordinary successes. But not where cities are concerned. So cities represent a fundamental political alternative and one that is closely tied with our, with our community identity, with our civic identity, with our sense of place, and with our sense of self. So it makes sense to say, let's go back to the city and see if we can make them work for us. Let's see if we can get them to deal with some of the issues that states don't deal with 
very well or at all. And the fact is, when we do that, what becomes apparent is that they do solve problems that others don't. That, in fact, mayors are a rather different kind of personality, necessarily, than national politicians. Mayors are, first of all, pragmatists. Their job is to solve problems and make things work. As mayor after mayor has said to me, I might be a Tory, I might be a socialist, I might be a liberal, I might be a conservative, but by God, I better get the snow off the street when it snows, and I better get the garbage picked up, and I better make sure kids in my city have education, and we hope preschool education, because I have to do that. Twice in the last two years, you may have looked with some wonder southwards at Washington, D.C., and noticed that the government of the most powerful country in the world, the United States of America, closed its doors. Twice. Well, first of all, the astonishing thing was nobody noticed. Not much changed. But the other thing was, think for a minute, you can close Washington, you can close a national government, but try to close Calgary. Try to close Banff. Try to close Toronto. Try to close Buffalo. Have you ever heard of a city that closes? Have you ever heard of a mayor stand up and say, you know what, I'm going to stand on principle here. My opponents don't agree with me. I'm going to close the city till I get some agreement from the other side. You know, cities in the Middle Ages during plague and siege, cities didn't close. You can't close cities. No police, no fire department, no public transportation, no schools, no hospitals. You just can't do it. The services of the city are what government is really about. We have turned government into an ideological quarrel. Maybe there are too many political scientists out there. But we like to think about government as these grand quarrels and these rather old-fashioned quarrels, 19th century quarrels about the industrial proletariat and old-fashioned capital, as if in an information service global economy those categories work very well or mean very much. But at the national level, we still divide up that way, left and right, labor, the people, and the capitalists. And it's not that there isn't deep inequality. It's not that global capitalism doesn't still create fundamental problems, but that when we organize ourselves politically around those old-fashioned divisions, we incapacitate ourselves to actually get work done. And that's why so many mayors today around the world refuse to join parties or identify with parties when they run. Bloomberg in New York started out as a Democrat, then he was a Republican. By the time he was elected, he said, I'm an independent. It's absurd to talk about those categories. Bristol, England was the first of several towns to opt to actually have a direct election of mayors because France and England, Ireland, and other countries actually have an indirect election of mayors through the city council. Bristol said, we'll do it directly. The first man to win a terrific mayor named George Ferguson, ran as an independent. He said, I'm not going to join the Labor or the Tory party. And he won as an independent. I was in Kansas last fall, so-called red state, a Republican state, very Republican. But what people don't know is that half of Kansas lives in towns over 5,000. And that of the 300 mayors who were at that municipal meeting, half of them said, yes, I'm probably a Republican. It's a Republican state, but I didn't, I didn't run as a Republican. It really doesn't matter because it's not, it has nothing to do with what I have to do when I solve problems. I tell a story in the book about Teddy Kollek, the mayor of Jerusalem, for many, many years in the 1980s. And by the way, he was fairly ideological. He was a Zionist. He wasn't very friendly to Palestine. But the reality was he was the mayor of a multi-ethnic, multi-religious city. He tells this wonderful story because he was constantly being plagued by Christian prelates and rabbis and imams coming into his office in City Hall and talking about, arguing about access to the holy sites and comparing their different histories and their legitimacy and the rights of their claims. And he finally said, gentlemen, gentlemen, spare me your sermons and I will fix your sewers. <laughs> well, that's what mayors have to do. 
don't give, the, don't give me your socialists and your conservative and your Tory sermons. Let me fix your sewers. Let me get the buses working. Let me make sure that kids have decent education. Let's make sure everyone can use the hospitals. Immigration, undocumented workers. The federal government of the United States says 12 million people who are resident in American cities today don't exist. They're illegals, undocumented workers. And as far as the feds are concerned, they have no status whatsoever. But the mayor of American City says, excuse me, they're here, they work, they drive, they have children who go to school, they use the hospitals, they, some of them commit crimes. They are here, and my job as mayor is to make sure that they are citizens of my city with the rights and the responsibilities of citizenship. And in Europe, they talk about urban visas. Mayor de Blasio of New York is talking about a city ID for everybody, regardless of how they got there. Because again, mayors are realists. And what they do is say, this is what I have to do as a realist. I have to deal with the reality of, in my city, 100,000 or 200,000 people who may have come illegally across a border but are there. And we have to make sure that they have all the rights and responsibilities of citizens. That's the realism. You can have a view about whether someone who came illegally deserves to stay or not, whether there should be a road to citizenship, but as mayor, that's not really your issue. You're dealing with people who are in your city and children in your city and people driving in your city. Would you rather have them have a license or just drive without a license because we pretend they don't exist? So mayors are realists, pragmatists, and problem solvers. They have to be. That is their job. They have the old-fashioned notion of government, which is government is there to provide a framework for our lives, provide transportation, health, education, social services, sanitation, so that we can get on with our lives. Politics is not a grand experiment in ideology and political philosophy. It's a frame, at least in the free world, in a free world, not the free world. I don't mean we have a free world, but in a free world, government is about providing a framework so that we can then do the things that we care about, raise families, pray in a church or mosque or synagogue or temple of our choice, work hard, do the things we care about. Government is that framework, and mayors get it. City councilors get it. Citizens of cities get it. We've got to make those things happen so we can get on with it. And when you turn government into a grand quarrel about aging ideologies from a different industrial period of the world, it's not very helpful to getting those things done. The result is, by the way, that these very popular, often mayors, are also, I like to say in the book, you know, mayors are homeboys, they're homies, homegirls. They're from the neighborhood. Most mayors, unlike a lot of senators and others, governors, they're born in, grow up, and come from the cities they govern. They are seen as neighbors taking a spell at government. Fellow citizens who say, I'll take a little more responsibility for a while. And seriously, Rob Ford has retained a good deal of popularity because he's still seen by a lot of people in Toronto as their neighbor, their guy from the town. If he had parachuted in from Vancouver or Edmonton or somewhere else, believe me, he wouldn't have had the career that he's had. But that's, we, we forgive mayors what we wouldn't forgive others. Ed Koch used to run, wander around New York City saying, how am I doing? Imagine your prime minister or my president wandering around and saying, how am I doing? He wouldn't want to hear the answer. And moreover, he wouldn't ask. The mayor, Cory Booker, when he was mayor of Newark, now he's a US senator, you can ask him why he left. I think it was a mistake. But when he was mayor of Newark, twice on the way to work, he was driving his own car. In one case, he stopped a mugging. In another case, he went into a building where people had been overcome by smoke and pulled two people out. Not because he was a bold mayor, but because he was a local citizen. He said later, I would have done that whether I was mayor or not. You know, I'm in this town. There was a fire. I stopped. I helped the way we ordinarily do help citizens. You read every day about an ordinary citizen pulling someone from the tracks of a metro or subway or helping somebody with a heart attack. And mayors do that because they're from the community. They're indigenous. And the result is, for the most part, 
The mayoralty is not a very successful or good platform for national office, despite the fact that some mayors are ambitious and despite the fact that we often say, gosh, this mayor is so good, I can't wait till he's a provincial governor or he's a prime minister. People have told me, Nenshi, you know, let's get him up there. I say, let's keep him where he is because what you do as mayor works very well and when you go up, it doesn't work. Here's a little statistic for you. I didn't know and I imagine many of you didn't know. Not one mayor of a major city of the United States in the last 225 years has ever been president. Not one. Cleveland came from Buffalo and he had been a mayor there for a few months and Hoover was mayor of Northampton for about six months. But all the mayors going all the way back, the Dalys and the LaGuardias, never done that because it's a different kind of job. And when you do it, you get in trouble. John Hickenlooper was a terrific mayor of Denver, Colorado. He was a brewer. He came from the brewery industry. He had a private brewery there, became mayor. He refused to act, although he was elected as a Democrat. He said, this is a common city. We need coalitions. I have to work across the board, public, private, work with civil society, work with business, work with the unions. And he did extremely well. He did so well that he ran for governor and won. John Hickenlooper is now the not so successful governor of Colorado, not so successful because he is being pushed by his own party. Say, why are you dealing with these Republicans? You're the governor. Screw the Republicans. They do the same to you. Your job now is to really make war on them. So as you go up the ladder, you're pulled into these ideological and partisan quarrels that simply don't work very well in the city. Gavin Newsom was one of the most successful mayors San Francisco ever saw. He's now lieutenant governor, a black hole into which he's vanished, and where he has no influence or authority and where the qualities that made him a great mayor are basically irrelevant. Let's see what Cory Booker, who was mayor of Newark, what happens to him now that he's a senator in the US Senate. We know several New York mayors from Bloomberg back to Giuliani had aspirations, but it just doesn't work, and it doesn't work because it's a different kind of guy. I mean, Bloomberg was a terribly effective mayor, but he seems, you know, his, his multi-partisanship, his unwillingness to choose sides, his ability to work across the board, even his own money, all of that becomes an obstacle in national politics. So mayors are unique, they're special, and as I say, this is, I'm not just talking about North America, the US, Canada. This is true in lots of different places. Bogota had a remarkable mayor named Mokas for 10 or 12 years, but he has never become the president of Colombia. He thought about it. Some of, them, some of them think about it, but it doesn't work. They don't get elected. On the rare occasions when they do, it doesn't work very well. So cities get governed in a particular local, you might say parochial way, that allows them to solve problems, to keep going, and to succeed in bridging these partisan divisions of right and left. One of the things is, you know, mayors, unlike presidents of the United States, they don't have a lot of power. They can't just give orders and make things happen. The only way you can get something done if you're a mayor in a city is to get the business community, to get civil society, to get the philanthropies, to get the hospitals, to get public officials, to get unions, and to get ordinary citizens behind you. You want to do something, you build a coalition. And when you don't, even a successful mayor is in trouble. Mayor Bloomberg had a great and important idea. Great big sodas make American kids fat, and obesity, as you know, among teens in America is a big problem. So he said, let's ban 16-ounce drinks. The trouble is, he did it this way, he said, Drinks are very bad for you, I know that, I'm going to ban them, and like it or leave it, that's going to be the way it is. And the very communities being served, the communities of color, the school communities rebelled because they didn't like being told. He had not reached out to them and brought them into a coalition to make them feel this was their policy. It became a bureaucratic policy shoved down their throat. And at that point, City Hall in New York looked like Brussels. It was giving good orders in the name of good norms to a people who were not engaged in making that their 
issue. And when people try to tell anybody what to do because it's a good idea, at best you have benevolent dictatorship, and at worst you just have dictatorship. And it simply doesn't work. And mayors don't operate that way on the whole. And Mayor Bloomberg on the whole didn't operate that way. On smoking, where he eventually more or less banished smoking in all of New York, he got the buy-in of the bars and the restaurants and the hotels and the places that were initially resistant. He reached out to them. He showed them why it would be good for them and their workers and so forth, which is what mayors have to do and what they can do. So when we think about a world in which government is not very effective, then let's look to mayors. But what about this? I'll end with this. There is one area you might say, well, this is all very well. But you started out saying we live in a world of global problems, and now your solution is to go back to parochial cities that were there before nation states. Aren't you going the wrong direction? Don't we need global government, not local government? And how are cities going to contribute to the solution of global problems? And let me just take a few minutes and say a word about that, because that is essential. The original subtitle of my book was not dysfunctional nations, rising cities. It was, if mayors rule the world, why they should and how they already do. And the how they already do part referred to the fact that there are dozens and dozens of intercity associations and networks and organizations in which cities are already working together across borders on all kinds of problems. It's not just that cities should rule the world. It's that in many ways, they're the only ones who are doing things together to do so. Organizations like United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG, have been around for 100 years since World War I. ICLE, the Environmental Issues Organization of Cities, it's been around for 25 years. The C40 that Bloomberg and others started, C40 Climate Cities, now 65 mega cities working on climate together. City Protocol, Cisco Systems in the city of Barcelona creating a global virtual platform for sharing best practices. There are dozens and dozens of these organizations where cities are cooperating together across borders to fix things. So it's not just that cities can do it one by one. They also can and do cooperate together to solve problems. And they, if you look carefully at who does what, they are the ones who are actually succeeding, where states are not. And let me just give you and come to a conclusion with this example. Let me give you the example of climate change. So very important. 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when the United Nations COPS process began on environmental change that gave birth to the Kyoto Protocol, there was a hope, this was in the 1990s, that the nation states of the world would recognize that destroying the planet would be a disastrous thing to do, and something had to be done. And the UN and nation states, under the leadership of places like Canada, you're young, you won't remember those times when Canada was a good climate citizen. <laughs> really took the leadership. But we have seen in the last 20, 25 years the total failure of that project. Since Copenhagen, we have seen 185 nations every year come together in a different place to explain why their sovereignty prevents them from doing anything meaningful, to explain why the influence of the carbon industry, the petro industry that rules the world, and talks about jobs, prevents them from doing anything, and they go home again. And during that 25 years, temperatures have crept up, carbon emissions have increased, and we now are on the threshold of a world in which we are passing limits where there's no going back, and where two, three, four degrees of warming, five, six, seven, even meters of sea rise seem to be inevitable because nations can't and won't do anything. And whether you attribute to the power of money and the power of the carbon industry to do as they please or the supine weakness of nation states in taking on the carbon industry, the fact is we are in deep trouble. But there's one place where progress is being made and it is in cities. And five years ago in Copenhagen, when 200 almost nations were there and failed, Two or 300 mayors had been invited. They stayed. 
And today, in organizations like the C40 and in ICLEI, and in the measures that cities are taking one by one also, a real impact on climate's being made. Not a surprise. 80% of global GDP comes from cities. Something like 75, 78% of carbon emissions come from cities. So cities can actually make it, despite their carbon footprint, there's so many people and so much industry, that's where cars, ports, that's where the greenhouse gases come. So whether or not states do anything, cities can do a lot. The mayor of Los Angeles, Via Raigosa, whose term was up just last year, in his six years, he realized the port of Los Angeles, the largest port in the United States, 40% of the goods of the United, that come into the United States come through Long Beach and Los Angeles ports. That port was responsible for 40% of the carbon emissions in LA. So he greened up the port. He insisted that the tankers and container ships that come in be electrified. They don't sit idling their big diesel engines while they offload and onload. They plug in like the yachts do in Cap Ferrat. So they're electrified during that period. The 12,000 trucks and lorries that come in every day, he upgraded the hybrid engines. And with a few other measures, he cut port emissions in half. And since they were 40% of emissions, that's more or less a fifth of carbon emissions in LA in five years gone. New York has the oldest stock, housing stock and business building stock in the United States. It leaks energy. About 10 to 15% of all energy is wasted. So Bloomberg put in a new insulation program for old buildings, higher standards for new buildings. He painted the roofs white. Next time you fly in over Brooklyn or the Bronx, look at all the white roofs. Simple little thing, paint the roofs white. Reflects sunlight, allows air conditioning to work better. Bogota, Medellin did it with rapid transit bus systems on the surface that took cars off the street. Different cities do it different ways, but cities are able to do it. We know the global impact of bike share, of congestion fees, of pedestrian zones. Those are all shared best practices. And without any legislation, without anything else, cities are making a genuine impact on carbon emissions and greenhouse gases. And while the government of Canada is busy trying to figure out how to export the filthiest oil that's destroying the environment here so it can destroy everybody else's environments and eventually make its way to Europe and turn into carbon emissions, the cities around North America are scheming and trying to figure out how they can take measures that will reduce carbon emissions. And they are succeeding. So from carbon emissions, to immigration, with urban visas, city IDs, to many, many other problems. What we are finding is that when mayors work one by one, they do fabulous work, and when they work together, they can actually address global problems that states don't address. And that's why the final proposal that I make in the book that has become a ongoing process that could lead to a reality is the convening of a global mayor's parliament. The United Nations has demonstrated that all of the deficiencies of states and their sovereignty are simply replicated at the global level, represented most forcefully by the veto in the Security Council, which means the Security Council will never intervene anywhere in ways that enhance security because one or another of the great nations divided ideologically, politically, commercially from one another will veto it. But a global assembly of cities, a parliament of mayors, not one that gives commands, but that simply allows mayors and cities to assemble regularly, maybe every three months on a virtual platform and every year or two in person, allows the sharing of best practices, the common work cities are doing around climate change, around immigration, around security, because city to city security is increasingly important New York has a, one of the best intelligence squads, anti-terrorist intelligence squads in the world, and in the new war against terrorism, it's intelligence, not a B-1 bomber or a Navy that's important. That intelligence squad no longer is deployed to Washington. Giuliani tried that after 9-11. After a year and a half, they came home and said, there's no intelligence in Washington <laughs> of any kind. And Ray Kelly, 
the new police commissioner under the mayor, then said, let's send our intel squad city to city, one to Frankfurt, one to Hong Kong, one to Jakarta, one to London, one to Rio. Let's put our intelligence squad in touch with other intelligence squads in other cities, and let's do city-to-city -city intelligence sharing because the other, that, that's where the information is. And one reason New York's remained relatively safe, despite the fact it's the number one target for terrorists around the world, has been intercity intelligence sharing. So even in this area of national security that most people say, well, that's something cities can't do. It's an area where cities are doing what nations can't. So a global mayor's parliament is an idea that would permit cities to formalize this sharing, to work more systematically together, to create a network of networks. There are already a lot of urban networks. This would be a network of networks, a keystone in the arch of intercity associations. And it would be a way for cities to take their wisdom, their experience, and their pragmatism locally to the global level. It's a perfect example of a word I love, glocality. The localness of participatory cities, the globalization of the reality of the world. Jean Monnet said in the 1940s, we live in a world where power is too big and broad and global for states, but participation is too small for states. States are the perfect wrong size. Too big for participation, too small for power. Cities are small enough for participation and democracy but when they work together can create a global association large enough to begin to deal with the global problems that we face today. So cities are not just an interesting sideline, a kind of nice little way to chat about the urban communities we live in and love. It is, I believe, a fundamental source of new civic and political and economic solutions for a world desperately in need of solutions. It is a new chance, an opportunity for democracy to work because while people don't trust democracy nationally, they still trust democracy in the cities. There's an optimism about the city. Young people who are cynical about democracy will say, yeah, but in my neighborhood, it works in my district, my town district, it works. I kind of believe in it at that level. I'll get engaged at that level. So it's another chance, it's a second chance for the democratic ideal back in the place where democracy was born in the polis. And so with a global mayor's parliament, you move from a world that started with the polis to a world that possibly can culminate in the cosmopolis, the union of cities the union of citizens from cities who understand public goods and public interests and who when they work together with the diversity, the multiculturalism, the creativity, the entrepreneurial qualities of the city, the deep creativity of cities can once again solve problems that in recent years have defied solution. So in this new cosmopolis, there is a new hope not only for pragmatism and problem solving and governance, but a new hope for democracy. And that's why, for me, it makes perfect sense that mayors should rule the world. <laughs>